God. Now, in the new moon, we started this subject right here, and we went through part one. This is going to be part two. And uh, it's a man approved of God. And we went through some of the scripture text. And, uh, well, I ain't got one of the little pamphlets up here, but y'all got a copy of all the, the uh, scriptures on that paper I turned in. I probably had it laying down up there. We then went through four sets of scriptures that's found right on the middle pages there. And uh, I, I, I left them real, I almost left them too light, you can't see them. We then went through Acts 2, verses 22 through 36. We went through Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 19. We went through Acts chapter 3, verse 22 through 24. And St. John chapter 12, verse 44 through 50. And uh, those scriptures basically tell us that, uh, that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, not Acts 2.38. Again, I mean you understand, he did not preach Acts 2.38. You read it, you'll see it. Peter preached Acts 2.22. And uh, years ago, the Lord told me, he said, wherever you go, preach this first. And I thought, well, what? And I got through reading Apostle Peter's doctrine. First thing he preached at Cornelius is Acts 10, 38. The same thing about God anointing Jesus of Nazareth. Acts 2, 22, he preached on the day of Pentecost. The first message to the Jews, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. That was his first message. And he told me to do the same thing. And I told you, I went down in Atwood, Tennessee. We had a service in some lady's house. And uh, after I got through preaching that, I went in there to the kitchen sink, got me a drink of water. I turned around, she was standing at the door. And she said, last night I had a dream that a minister that was preaching the truth was standing there and getting a drink of water. That's a confirmation to me. That's who that helped. And uh, when we go through these scriptures, you'll see Jesus is a man approved of God, not God personally. Now it just shakes them all to pieces in Trinitarian and one is theology. To actually think like that. But had we rather have the truth as something somebody drummed up? Because as we have went through those scriptures there, we had Moses. God spoke to Moses and said, I'm going to raise up a prophet from Israel and I'll put my words in his mouth. He'll speak what I command him to speak. We had Jesus in St. John 12 said the words I speak I speak not of myself, but the Father sent me. He gave me a commandment of what to say, what to speak. Same thing. Jesus was commanded of God what to say. So wherever Jesus speaks and you think it's God, He's just obeying His God. I argue with them on the Facebook about Alpha and Omega thing. And they the one place that even come near close. And, it, and like I told him, I said, and if you think it is him saying it, he's just again doing the same thing there as he done in St. John 12, 44 through 50. He's speaking what's commanded him. And I told him, I said, but even that itself does not take away the fact that Jesus is in the presence of God or that everything is under him except the one that put everything under him. I said, none of that, none of that erases that. When Jesus in Revelation says, My God, four times, He's talking about His God. None of that theology stuff races that. None of it. John wanted, when I first got in, I was drilled constantly as a new minister, new, new Christian. St. John 1 and 1. St. John 1 14. Uh, St. John 14 9. Colossians 2, 9, 1 Timothy 3, 16. 
Anyone that's in the whole United States and the world, that's the first thing they drill to you, but they don't read you this other stuff. And they know they don't. They know they don't. And so we are. We're right down to this part right here. In Luke 1, verses 1 through 4, we're starting with, Jesus was faithful to God. Now, if somebody looked at us and said, I don't believe that, Brother Duck. Why, He was God. Why would I put down Jesus was faithful to God? Well, let's read. Let's start with Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. I guess I got both of them on there. I don't know if I do it. I think I do on this one. Paul wrote down and says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, the Messiah, Yeshua. You want to do Hebrew. There's some folks like Hebrew. Ain't nothing wrong with it. I've had some folks come on there and let them blast them people using the words Yeshua. Which I, I don't, when I preach, I use Jesus 99% of the time. Well, that's the way I pray. But, somebody else on there, uh, Shane, I forgot what, he used to be one of us, by the way, too. He believed in Sabbath, Holy Days, and all that. But he uses that name Yeshua probably 90% of the time. <laughs> and he asked, he said, well, if you, if you was uh, somewhere in the world, they thought your name was Ricardo. And uh, come to find out your name was Ricky. Well, once they find it out, would you want them to keep calling you Ricardo? Or you want them to actually call you for what you really are? And uh, in the Hebrew, his name is Yeshua. And that's one when Paul said he heard him speaking in the Hebrew language. I am the Lord. So he was not speaking our English. And something else we don't contemplate on, the name, there was no J in the English language till around 1600. So what did they call Jesus before 1600? It could have been Jesus, there was no J. So the apostles never, never, call Jesus what we call Jesus, even though it does work. I got the Holy Ghost called on Jesus. But uh, the intent of my heart was the Messiah, the one that was crucified when I was praying. Now, a Mexican may say, hey, Zeus. Now, I don't know what it is in Russia and China and not in Japan and all that. It, it don't sound like ours. But obviously it works. But sometimes it don't hurt to use the real name, Yeshua. You're not sinning by doing that. That's what the Hebrew is. So but some folks get on a tangent or they got that little pet peeve area there and they want everybody else to be wrong with them on that. When the name Yeshua is not really wrong at all. It's not wrong. And uh, anyway, he says, consider, since we're reading King James Version in English, the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Now what Paul say next? When it says who, it's talking about Christ Jesus. Who was faithful. Christ Jesus was faithful to him that appointed him. As also Moses was faithful in all his house. Who was Moses faithful to? Almighty God. Who is Paul, Apostle Paul, saying that Jesus is faithful to? Almighty God. The one that appointed him. Acts, I believe the book of Acts tells us that uh, about this man named Jesus uh, who he hath appointed. To be the judge. On that day when all the books are open, Jesus Christ will be the one doing the judging. We start 
remember Luke 1 through 4. 1, 1 through 4. I backed up. I didn't, see, I didn't have Hebrews down there, did I? I sure did. I missed that. Good. Well, we got something in there anyway. Let's go with Luke. Right here. And we're going to read 1 through 4. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. All right, let's establish that right there. Luke said, what I'm fixing right now in order are things that are believed among us. Now who's he talking about to us there? Among us? He has to be talking about Apostle Peter, Apostle John. He got talking about Bartholomew. He got to be talking about all the apostles of that day that are believing what Luke's writing down. Right? Among us, Christians of their day, I'm going to write down in order a declaration of things that are believed among us, not just me. So we're going to find out what Luke wrote down. Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. That's talking about the apostles. They were eyewitnesses. Verse 3. It seemed good to me also, as we got this number four, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order. <laughs> so he's going to write it in order. And Luke is saying he had perfect understanding. So if you've got any preacher among the oneness or trinity that don't believe what Luke wrote down, you don't have either he lied or you're lying. Because he said he's got perfect understanding and the Lord God Almighty had his recording to be put down in the book to be written by everybody in the world. Verse 4, that thou might know the certainty. Well, let's finish reading this one first. I didn't put it all down there. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. He's writing this uh, epistle down to, uh, thing down to uh, Theophilus. Not called epistle, called the gospel, but still writing to Theophilus. And he said, I'm going to write it in order. And we all believe this. All of us Christians believe this. That thou might know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So you've been instructed. Now let's look at Luke 1 verses 26 through 33 as he's writing this down. <clears throat> if you have your Bible you can read with me. I only got verse 32 on the post there. <clears throat> Verse 26, chapter 1, Luke. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that are highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. A shock, Mary, I ain't gonna come in there telling her that out there. That'd shock anybody, wouldn't it? The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. <laughs> angel have to tell her every, every time they appear to him, they gotta tell you that. Don't get scared. <laughs> Everybody gets scared. The angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, 
and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. So what did angel Gabriel tell Mary right here? He shall be great. He shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So an angel comes into Mary. She's not a theologian of our modern day theologies. Gabriel just walks right in there. The same one appeared to Daniel 500 years ago. Is probably still alive right now. Gabriel probably still doing something now. We don't know where he's at. We don't know who he appears to. If he don't tell his name. But always he told Daniel, he said, Fear not. I think Daniel fell over like a dead man. People get scared when they see an angel of God. <laughs> I don't know if his brother Terrell or what minister told this. He said some folks went out in the desert. And they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. God sent me there. Let me see a real angel. Want to see an angel. And all of a sudden they got a faint feeling about something behind them. They wouldn't even turn around. Matter of fact, got in the car and left. Got so scared. Uh, had a perception that something was behind them. Might be something without an angel, but what I'm saying is that sometimes any human is going to get scared when something out of nowhere just appears. And this angel didn't marry like that. He told her, you're going to have a son and, the, and God is going to give him the throne of his father David. Why was God going to do this? Anybody re realize the covenant that God made with David back in the Old Testament? God made a covenant with David. It's recorded in the Bible, probably in the book of Acts. Acts 2, I think. We just might have read last week. Where God has sworn with an oath to David that out of your loins, according to the flesh, that I will raise up Christ, the Messiah, to sit on the throne, your throne. So, when the angel comes in there and tells Mary, since you are the lineage of Judah and of David, I mean, you're in that same family line. You're going on down the road. And Mary, you're from that family. How many women, how many little girls had read the scripture text about that and each one thinking, it could be me. How many actually thought that? We don't know. I'm sure somebody did because they read it every Sabbath in the Sabbath uh, thing in Israel. They read Isaiah where God said he's going to do all this here. And I'm sure some of them thought, oh, what well, could it be me? And years and years, keep going by, keep going by, keep going by. And all of a sudden one day that angel comes running into the house where Mary was, a young lady, probably wasn't even 20 year old. Didn't say how old she was. And just tells her that, my goodness. She said, your little baby, God is going to give him the throne. When she took that baby up, hold her in her hand, she thought of what that angel said. Now, you don't you? How many believe her that she kissed him? <laughs> what well, mama would not want to hug that baby to death? Huh? Everybody does that. That's, that's a real mama. Except in her mind, she's thinking, an angel told me this. And I ain't even, I even had relations and, and I've got a baby. And Gabriel said, God's going to give this baby of mine the throne of David. Wow. I mean, we read in the Sabbath lessons, and, and back in their days, about like us, it was the four back, they didn't know David personally, no more than we do. And God said, I'm going to establish my throne forever. 
And I'm going to have David, one of your lineage, sit on that throne. And Mary holding that little baby thing. This is him. Kissing on him, loving on him. What grandma and grandpa probably did. Don't ever tell them about that, but common sense. Well, you know, they went crazy about it. Now, how many believe that Mary kept all that quiet and didn't tell grandma and grandpa what God told her? You know, because she didn't know any man she's going to have a baby. Don't you know she explained all that to them? And if they were any kind of believers at all about the power of God, then they looked at that little baby. Elizabeth, I'm sure she came over. And uh, all the kid folks. My goodness, they said, this is him? Praise God. Boy, don't you know they was all excited in them days. This is all history does now. Alright, let's go on. Look, Luke chapter 2. Verse 21 through 22, verse 39 through 40, and verse 52. Luke's right down in order. Praise God. In order. Luke chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. When eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Before she was even going to have a baby, she was told you're going to have a little baby boy. And you're going to name him, in our English we say Jesus. It was probably something else they called in their day. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished. Now what she had to do is go off her turtle doves. I think it had 40 days for her cleansing. And uh, when that came about, and another 80 if it was a girl, 40 if it's a boy. But when Jesus was eight days old, uh, he had to be circumcised. So in the, when the days of her purification, which would have been 40 days, according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem. And what did they do? Let's read verse 22 right here on the screen. When the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem. That's Jesus. And what did Mary do when they brought him to Jerusalem? Present him to who? The Lord. Would he be presenting him to himself? One is theology thinks that's what happened. Now Trinity may vary on that a little bit and say that was one person of God been given to the other. <laughs> now we know the truth of it. It's a shame they don't. She brought her baby, and if you can picture in her mind, a lot of folks dedicate their babies. A lot of folks do. You've said, I've, I've seen it done in church before, and they'll, they'll bring a little baby up there, and they'll have a preacher anointed with oil or do something, pray over and all that, and they'll kind of offer him up to God. So the, and they all lay hands on the old God take care of this little baby right here. You know, a lot of folks do that. And, uh, well, you can picture Mary, I probably where this comes from, by the way, people doing that. When she comes into the temple of Jerusalem and she brings him, him, him in there and offers him up to the Lord God Almighty. Because she knows he's special. And God is done saying they're going to put him on the throne of David. So she presented him to the Lord. In Luke 2, 39 and 40. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. And the child grew and worked strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Now, when it says right here, the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, this is not Holy Ghost spirit. You go to the Greek language on that, it's not talking about Holy Ghost. We have a body, soul, spirit. Jesus had a body, soul, spirit. And Jesus 
The child grew from a little bitty baby to now he's walking. And probably getting close to 12 years old, so he's just like in the 12 year old boy. Maybe too big to hold. But he's still a little boy. He's not God yet. He ain't got to that place to reveal God. Somebody said, yeah, but especially the Holy Ghost overshadowing Mary, and that makes him God. They, of course, it tell you that makes him God. I don't write, read, no, nothing in there tells you that's what makes him God. That's what people think. What about when God created Adam out of the dust of the earth? Would that make him God because he didn't have no daddy? He didn't have, and everything that was put in him to make him alive come from who? Come from God. Adam was without sin. Adam had a body. He had a soul. He had a spirit. God put it all together and made it, made it able to move. Put a spirit inside it. Made him a living soul. He didn't have sin. He was sinless. But that didn't make him God. And God just chose to put him in the womb of a woman because humans are right here. And let him be born. And they were one God. So you've got this 12 year old boy or less, whatever the scripture states there. He's growing. He's working strong in spirit. He's being filled with wisdom. And what tops it off, Luke says the grace of God is upon Jesus. Now, what's everybody say grace is? I don't know if that's true or not. They always, I've always heard unmerited favor. All I know is that, that God Almighty was specifically paying attention to this little boy. The grace of God is upon him. Now, I'll give you another scripture quotation again. Now, I'll tell 42, 5, and 6. He ain't got to there yet, but that, I guess it's good to use it here. Isaiah 42, 5, and 6, the Creator, which is God, referring to Jesus of Nazareth, and said, I've called you in righteousness. I'll hold your hand. I'm going to keep you. What's that mean in, in pure language? The grace of God is upon this child. God is protecting him. He did not commit sin. God's protecting him. This is his son. He's growing up. He's a human, but he's growing up. And God makes sure the devil don't get him like he has everybody else. And when they tried to have him killed, God moved in on the scene. Sent an angel said, take him, take him, take him to Egypt. When Herod died, Angel went back out there and told him, said, now you bring him back. God protected him on every move. They couldn't touch him. Jesus said, you have no power at all against me except it's given to you from above. He said, you tell that old fox. You can't touch me unless God says it's time to touch me. That's about what he was telling old, that good old guy. Thought he was smart. Tell you what, these demons ain't smarter than you think they are. They smart enough, they wouldn't even kill them. <laughs> that just give us our salvation. The dummies didn't even know that. Give it open the door up for us. All right, verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and statue and in favor with who? with God and man. My goodness, why can't any one person see this? I mean, I did when I was one. This. Why do the others don't want to see it? Why is it they're, they're so wrapped up in their little, little cliche? They're afraid that if they stand up for the truth of the word, they'll rock that boat just a little bit, and the pastor and whoever else will give them the boot and kick them out the door. Scared! Scared! <coughs> Bend over backwards to tell a lie. 
They don't think they are, but they are who they say different than what the Word said. In my Bible, and Luke said he had perfect understanding, and he said, this is what we all believe. Talking about Peter and John and all them. That we believe Jesus increased in wisdom and statue. That Jesus increased in favor with God. Somebody said he's God. He ain't even manifesting God right now. He cannot, Jesus of Nazareth cannot manifest God until he has learned obedience. <coughs> you understand that? I'm trying to get everybody here. I hope everybody understands that here because you're not going to hear that, son. Jesus cannot fulfill 1 John, Timothy 3.16 until he first has learned obedience by things he suffers. After he's done that, then he is worthy to raise him hands and let God come down and take his boat in that tabernacle. That's the plan that God set in motion. Praise God. So Jesus had to increase in favor with God. Jesus had to go up and learn. And what did Isaiah say? I don't know if we got that scripture. I don't think we did. Remember the, the text just say, uh, in Isaiah 7? Jesus Christ had to learn the difference between good and evil. Just like us. Now the difference in me and him was, I chose evil. I chose junk. Jesus learned the difference between good and evil. He had a choice to make with that man. And he refused the evil. And he chose the good. So he could honor his God. And God said, I'll hold your hand. I'll keep you. I'll let my grace be upon you. I'll watch you everywhere you go. I'll raise you up. Because he raised him up for a reason. He was born to be the sacrifice. And that's why right at the tail end of this thing, God gave him a choice. If you want to be taken down, the Bible said he was heard in that prayer, didn't it? If you want to come down from that cross and you don't want to suffer this, you just give me the word. But the thing is, nobody in the world, no human being can be saved except you. So Jesus rejected that selfish impulse. That's why God highly exalted him. That's why God gave him all the power in heaven and earth except him. Now Paul knew what he was writing in all this. Let's go. Isaiah 50, verse 4 through 7. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the Lord. The Lord God hath opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. This was written about Jesus of Nazareth. Not Isaiah. The Lord God had given me the tongue of the word that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. Jesus had that wisdom and ability with people in his day and time while he was ministering. When Jesus was a child growing up, it says here in prophecy, He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakens my ear to hear as to learn. God is raising him up. God woke him every morning talking to him. You've got to remember this. In our sin, we broke fellowship with God. Can y'all catch on to that one? When Adam was made, body, soul, and spirit, 
God deals with human beings from the Spirit. Through sin, we broke that fellowship. And we all and everybody relies on this flesh and on the outside forces that we recognize, not listening to the inside. When we are born again, the Holy Ghost reignites that fellowship. And while we're growing, we're not up to par where Jesus of Nazareth was right there. He never lost it. Jesus of Nazareth never lost that contact with his God. And God dealt with him in the Spirit. Not Holy Ghost necessarily, but in the Spirit of man. Whereas when we were born again and we have received the Holy Ghost, that reignites that one area of, of reconnection to God. Now, that's why Paul told the Christians, if you live after the flesh, you're going to die. Because if you have to get in the Holy Ghost, rely on this senses and dictate to how you're going to move around and obey God, then you're going about the wrong way. You're still relying on your flesh. You have to learn to be led by the Spirit, which the Holy Ghost gives us, and we have that contact with our God. You have to learn. Jesus didn't have to go through that process necessarily, even though He would walk morning by morning, and God was teaching Him. And, uh, and there's a scripture text, I probably don't have that one down, where Jesus said, as my Father has taught me. Now, I think in John 8. As my Father has taught me me. So Jesus said God taught him. Taught him. Here Isaiah's plain, a God spoke by Isaiah. God woke him every morning. Jesus of Nazareth woke every morning from my little baby all the way up till he would get the normal common senses of every human being gets. And that 12 year old, he done and he didn't just zap and know the Bible or what we call Bible. He went to the Sabbath synagogues. They read the scriptures. He learned them just like everybody does by reading. But it, he come through that phase there. And then at age 12, he could quote scriptures out of the Torah that the big shots were amazed at. How in the world can he do this at 12 year old? How does he know all that? He knows all the scriptures. Because Jesus was intent as a child to do the will of God. God woke him every morning. He's reading the Bible. He's reading the Torah part of it. He's learning that. He's meditating on God. He's talking to God. God's protecting him, shielding him, training him. But he still ain't come down to manifest his glory until yet because it says Jesus had to learn obedience. Praise God. In that verse 6, it's something I didn't re put on there or nothing like that, but verse 5, the Lord got open my ear. I wasn't rebased. Talking about Jesus. Verse 6, I gave my back to the smiters, cheeks of them plucked off the hair. I hid not my face with shame and spitting. That's what they done to Jesus. And he said, the Lord God will help me. So, that's about Jesus. Now, we had just left where Jesus increased in favor with God. He went through the teenage years out there working on chicken coops, building houses, whatever. He was a carpenter, carpenter's son, Joseph. Now, it doesn't tell us Bible-wise, history-wise, that Jesus, uh, Joseph died when Jesus was 18 years old. I don't know how they know that. They ain't right on that. May or may not be. I do know in the, later on in the account when Jesus ministered, Joseph ain't the picture. So Jesus said, have you ever did and went through the grief? 
Now, what else does the Bible say about Jesus from Nazareth? A man of sorrow. A man acquainted with grief. So he has grief. And he has sorrow just like every human being. He's working. He's getting up over the morning. He's going out there to help Joseph in carpentry. And after Joseph dies from at least, if he did die at 18, which I just, would just say that might be right, from there to he talks to 30 year old, he's still got 10 years of time of working out there. Working like everybody else. Nobody knows this is the Messiah. Did nobody know that was the Messiah? Mary did. And I'm sure Mary pointed him out some scripture text in there and said, son, this is about you. And Jesus was consciously aware of that. And he prayed to his God. He prayed like he's supposed to pray. And God was protecting him. And he wouldn't get involved in things all the other people were getting involved with. And he'd go to the synagogue. And here's what happened. According to, according to Luke, said had perfect understanding. He said, we all believe this. So I'm believing John did. Matthew did. Bartholomew and all them others. Jesus hears John the Baptist preaching. He knows the scriptures about the one crying in the wilderness, prepare you well of the Lord. Now, first of all, the Lord God has not, he's still not in that flesh. But John is out there prophesying. Prepare you the way of the Lord. Now God is getting ready to come on the scene now in human flesh. And Jesus is aware of those scriptures. Plus, I am sure, you think back, it doesn't tell us scripture wise, but common sense, human beings, when Mary and Elizabeth's family got together, do you not think they didn't get together for some kind of reunion things or fellowship or whatever visits? You know, Zacchaeus, uh, John the Baptist, Daddy, you know, and they talk about Bible stuff and they talk about uh, John the Baptist's Daddy went into the temple and see in a trance and saw a vision and, and how that John's name would be called John and he's going to prepare the way of the Lord and, and I don't know if they talked to John or John just wouldn't hit himself. But if he did, anywhere along the line, scripture-wise, they know that he's going to prepare the way of the Lord. Mary is also talking to Elizabeth and saying, hey, uh, the angel Gabriel visited me and my little son Jesus here is going to be that one. Now, I believe they talk this stuff. Who would? No other family might not have, but I'm sure they did. And all of a sudden, they're going to the synagogues every Sabbath. Every Sabbath, Jesus is there with Mama and his brothers and sisters. Tells us he had four brothers, says he had sisters. Didn't say how many, so he had a big family. They're going to the synagogue. They're sitting there and everybody else sitting there. The rabbi uh, gets behind that little pulpit thing and takes that scroll off the shelf because they don't have books like we do. And they roll it back and they'll read part of Isaiah or Ezra or something else they read. And all of a sudden, one time, they noticed on the Sabbath, you know, Jesus went on a four-day fast, by the way. But one time, Jesus got in line. Uh, he'd been hearing John the Baptist preaching, and, and the God had done moved upon him and told him to go get in line. Jesus walks out there when everybody else is lining up. He's standing in line. I don't know if John the Baptist recognized him directly because they were cousins. And he knew that who Jesus was. Like I said, I'm sure the families talked. I'm sure Elizabeth told John that my Mary, Mary's had a baby and she didn't know a man. And it's just like Isaiah said, he was born of a virgin. And so that's the hill. So when uh, John the Baptist was baptizing these folks, he looks up there and he sees him. Man, almost feel it. Almost feel like what John would feel. 
He said, there stands one among you whom you know not. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. I'm not worthy to stoop down and latch his shoes. Praise God. Jesus walks right up there. He looks at him. He knowing he's going to be the baptizer. And he says, I have need to be baptized of you. And you're coming to me. And Jesus said, suffer to be so now. To fulfill all righteousness. He baptized in Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus comes out of the water. Raises his hands to heaven. Here we got baptized. I got baptized in the river. And I, and I know the others done that too. And I did too. We come out of that cold December Mississippi River after they baptized me that day. I raised my hand to heaven. The Holy Ghost didn't come down. <laughs> it didn't do it for seven days. Seven days later it did. But Jesus raised them hand to heaven and he had not known any sin. He was sinless. And God said, I called you in righteousness. We all got called while we were sinners. He got called in righteousness. And he raises them hands to heaven. He's learned obedience by things he suffered throughout his life. He learned obedience to God. And the Bible said the Holy Ghost came down. And the Bible says, let's read 21 through 23. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and what? Praying. Now God don't have to pray, does He? But Jesus of Nazareth did. And after Jesus was baptized and praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended. Wasn't already down there. Descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. And he didn't mean, in him I'm well pleased. He meant exactly what he said. I am pleased with you. He's the only human that's done obedience. That's walking without sin. Transgression of God's law. And God said, I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. 30 year old man. There about. Sit about. 30 years of age. And the Holy Ghost coming down upon him, abides in him. It ain't here but John 3, 34. What John say? God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Right? What does that mean? It means he got all the Godhead. That meant that body, that temple was the first human being that was in compliance with what God ordained before the world. And since he didn't know any sin, and since God is preparing all humans for this, the first one had to be without sin to be a sacrifice. And Jesus raises his hands and God comes down, takes his abode in this man. And the first thing the Holy Ghost does, lead him to go on a 40 day fast. And the devil come and tempted Jesus three times. And Jesus had to refuse it. Adam failed. The first man failed. The second man is the Lord from heaven. After we're born again, we're born from above. Jesus said, Father, they're not all this world, even as I am not of this world. You see, when you get the Holy Ghost, you are born from above. You're not a normal human being like everybody else running up down the street cussing, smoking, drinking. They may look at you on that shelf, what you was before, but you are different than you was before you were born again. You're born from above now. Now you're one of them. Like an angel. We're from above. 
Bible says we are. If you're born from above, you're from above. When you're born again. Now that first man is of the earth earthly. Praise God. And John, uh, Apostle John said, God gave teachers a spirit without measure. Colossians 2 and 9, that's where that comes into play. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All of God is right there inside him. Now, does it change Jesus? It don't, does it? He's still Jesus. He's still got his mama. He's still got brothers. But now God's fully in him. Goes on a 40 day fast. He comes back out after that fast in the power of God. Praise the Lord. Let's see what we've got next. The fullness of God. Now, now, we might have time to go through this. Now, the fullness. Up to this point in time, God is not manifest in the flesh. Now, He is. Picture a light bulb like that back yonder that's blown out. And if it was just screwed in and no light's coming out of it because the switch ain't is off. That's the way any human being or Jesus of Nazareth was until he got ready to flip the switch. Put electricity to it. God did not flip that switch on Jesus of Nazareth until His Spirit came down. God gave Him the Spirit without measure. The fullness of God is in Him. And then God flips that switch and, and light begins to display out of the man Jesus. The light of Almighty God. He was in the world. The world was made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. That's where that fits. St. John 1 and 10. Now, Isaiah 50, 42, and verse 5 and 6 ain't wrong just because John 1 and 10. It said the Creator called him. The Creator said, I'll hold your hand. The Creator said, I'll protect you, and I'm going to give you for a covenant. But John 1 and 10 said, He was in the world, the world was made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Not talking about Jesus of Nazareth, talking about the Creator that called Him. When all Scriptures go together, that's the picture it paints. And Jesus Christ had God to come down. First man now. First man. What did the Bible say? Firstborn of many brothers? He's the firstborn of many brothers. We on the journey and heading for that goal. That's the goal line. That's what we're trying to get to. We, we're still trying to put that sin out down. We got the Holy Ghost, but we got to fight. We finally come into sin. We try our best to take it water like a piece of paper and throw it away. We're growing. John 3.34 did have it, didn't it? Did have it have down there? For he whom God has sent, speak of the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. God gave Jesus the Holy Ghost in full power. Caution 2 8 9. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after the Messiah, Christ. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's why we don't believe in Trinity. Now, one of these folks are close to this right here, but I'd like horse you can have your Folks don't count if you ain't got it right. If you ain't teaching it right, you won't have that one faith. You'll have a faith different than that. See, you've got to have that one faith to start believing that you can overcome and receive what Jesus had and do the same works He did. Even before you get it. Like I said, there is no coach in football that if a player on there looks at them big men out there and says, Coach, I don't think we can do it. 
I know we're, we're supposed to be wanting to go out there and pass that goal line and score. But if you see how big them guys are, we can't do it. What do you think that coach going to do to that old boy? I don't care who he is, he's chicken. You sit down over here, you, you think we can do it? Yeah, I, I believe we can do it. <laughs> you know how the boys are. I believe we can do it. We can growl out and they can. <laughs> so they'll put them out there. They got to believe they can score that touchdown before they score that touchdown. You got to believe that you can absolutely take on the fullness of God before you get there. You got to believe that Jesus, I'm going to pray and seek your faith. I'm going to try to walk in the commandments of God and be faithful and learn how Jesus walked. That's why the Lord told me up the grave. He said, don't try to make this happen. He said, your job is to learn obedience. So you have to try to make it happen. When the time comes, he said, I'll make it happen. So you ain't worried about that part. I'm trying to, oh, what can we do? Are we, are we holding our tongue just right? Have I got to learn how to turn them back flip right on my feet? God, what can we do to make these scriptures work? He said, you just learn to walk the word. Jesus knew how. He was increasing in favor with God and now all of a sudden he has the fullness of the Godhead in him. 1 Timothy 3, 16, without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. Godliness. Mystery. You know, I don't know why I pick up on that right there. Great is the mystery of godliness. How do you get godliness? It's a great mystery. It's a process. It's a process of laying down sins and putting on the attributes of the Lord. God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. After Jesus had displayed the power of God, wherever He goes, that fulfilled the saying, Emmanuel, God with us. What Jesus Christ said, I and my Father are one. That's why He could say, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father, even though He Himself is not the Father. He's manifesting his God. Wherever he goes, God is fully in him. Praise God. How much we got here? John, John. We even got John 20. Yep. Okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to cut it off and save that other part for later. Praise God. Being full of God did not stop Jesus from praying. Praise God. So we'll halt it right there.